Well, good morning. Good morning, and welcome to the Morning Report, a, pro a reduction of FightBackMedia.com, FightBackMedia.com, FightBackMedia.com. We are thrilled that you are with us this morning. It's Friday morning, uh, September the 4th, 2020, in the year of our Lord. Uh, it's two days away from my birthday, so l listen, if you guys are going to ship me a chair, you got to do it this weekend. Um and you'll find out that I'm that I'll be sitting up a little higher, because this chair, the hydraulics are, pff, you know, like you know, you know, low riders hydraulics are. <laughs> it would happen to my Lincoln, you know, the the airbag thing on the Lincolns and, and the Murphy Marquis eventually get holes in them, and you know, with a low rider, my chair is a low rider. Uh, again, it is great to be with you this morning. We've got a lot of serious stuff to talk about, but I'm gonna smile because. Uh, in two days, I'll be 60 years old. Yay, me, 60. Uh, you know, I'm thinking at, at 20 years old, did I believe in, did I think I'd be 60? I don't know. I, didn't, I never really thought about it. You know, a lot of people think about that kind of, I, don't, I never really, it never really even occurred to me as to being something that I would even think about. It wasn't that I, did, I didn't think I'd make 60. Um, that wasn't it. I just didn't think about it. It just, it just didn't, it just didn't come to mind. I'm like, man, eh, whatever. There are 60 year olds and I, and they were, you know, I'm telling you 40 years ago, a six year old was an old ass person. That's, he, it's funny. I guess the closer you, you get to those ages. And, and I think that with, um, healthcare being the way it is and maybe 60 isn't that old anymore. They, some, somebody dies at 60 and people go, they were so young. No, I just go. Dang, they weren't they weren't that old. Um, anyway, on Sunday I'll be sixty, and I am I am happy about it. I really am. After what I went through, I'm thrilled about being sixty. It's a big six hole, uh, so, <laughs> and I'm still getting to do whatever the heck I want. So life is super good. Uh, thank you again for the birthday wishes that have already come in. Um. Before we get started today, I want to remind you that we are, on election day, we are getting out as Fightback Media, and we're canvassing our areas where we live, in you know, in, in our Fightback Media's uh, universe, and making you know making videotapes of what you see. Um, if you can interview people, super. If you can't, or if you don't feel comfortable doing that, that's fine too. Uh, but I just want documentation of how election day goes. And even days leading up to uh, up to and after Election Day. On the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, of, of course, of November. And then 4th, 6th, and 7th, at least. How are things going where you are? I'd love to hear reports. And I want to get a repository of those things so we can document this election. It's going to be super important that we document this election. Um, and from some of the stories that I'm going to tell you this morning, you, you're going to agree with me. All right, we'll be back right after these messages. Again, my name is Will Lawson, and this is The Morning Report, a production of FightBackMedia.com, FightBackMedia.com, FightBackMedia.com. We'll be back right after these messages. Do you care about black lives? The people that run Baltimore don't. I can prove it. Walk with me. They don't want you to see this. I'm Kim Klasik. This is Baltimore, the real Baltimore. This is the reality for black people every single day. Crumbling infrastructure, abandoned homes, poverty, and crime. Baltimore has been run by the Democrat Party for 53 years. What is the result of their decades of leadership? Baltimore is one of the top five most dangerous cities in America. The murder rate in Baltimore is 10 times the U.S. average. The Baltimore poverty rate is over 20%. Homicide, drug, and alcohol deaths are skyrocketing in our city. Do you believe Black Lives Matter? I do. The vast majority of crime in Baltimore is perpetrated against Black people, who make up 60% of the population. So why don't we care about our communities? The Democrat Party have betrayed the Black people of Baltimore. If the politicians walk the streets like I do, they would see exactly how their policies and corruption affects us. But they don't want to see it. They don't want you to see this. Go to any Baltimore neighborhood and ask this question. Do 
Do you want to defund the police? No. No. Absolutely not. I had three sons killed in Baltimore City. And I think if we defund the police, office, it's going to be worse than that. So no, I'm opposed to that. What are you going to defund the police for? Why? How do you defend your city, your community? Families are losing people. It's not just Baltimore. The worst place for a black person to live in America is a Democrat-controlled city. It's 2020. Name a blue city where black people's lives have gotten better. Try. I'll wait. Look at this. How are children supposed to live here and play here? Democrats think black people are stupid. They think they can control us forever. That we won't demand better and that we'll keep voting for them forever. Despite what they've done to our families and our communities. Are they right? I'm Kim Klasik and I'm running for Congress because I actually care about black lives. All black lives matter. Our communities matter. Baltimore matters. And black people don't have to vote Democrat. This is your brother, Anton Tucker, better known as Tony X. The reason why you see people outside and upset is because they were led to be that way. The main goal of the liberal today is to make sure that the black feels disenfranchised because they're the ones doing it to you. And they also make sure that your white conservative brothers and sisters feel powerless to talk to you. Black history isn't in the school books. Who do you think started the educational system that is currently brainwashing our children? Jimmy Carter's administration. Why is it that when Obama was in office for eight years, he didn't get prison reform done? See, I see people saying Trump's racist, but I see that prison reform was done. Over 90,000 black and brown brothers and sisters coming home from prison. I see opportunity zones up and running. Think about it. Black historical colleges, the most funding they've ever had in history, and it came from Donald Trump. For the politicians that think that it's okay to defund police officers, to make sure that the officers within these communities can't do their jobs, shame on you. And as a new leader, I'm gonna tell all the leaders coming up, it's time for us to stand up and lead. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me. God bless you. Good morning. Again, welcome back to uh, the Morning Report. My name is Willie Lawson. And again, this report is a production of fightbackmedia.com. 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 Um, before we get started, I want to give you the COVID numbers. The COVID numbers. Um, I think it's okay. Uh, first of all, because this is going to be on YouTube and we're going to talk about COVID and they're going to be trying to, going to be trying to get us. You know, what's interesting about all of this that you found out, and this is not part of our show, it's just, an, this is extra, this is bonus stuff. Good for you. Um, that we found out on the CDC website a few days ago that only 6% of the death certificates um, have been, uh, that, that were COVID-related deaths were COVID only. Now, the pushback is amazing because they think, uh, while well, they're trying to portray us as stupid, like we can't understand logic. So I want to make sure that everybody knows that we can. 180,000, 189,000, almost 190,000 COVID-related deaths. Only 11,000 356 of those deaths were COVID only. The other deaths were um, people who had underlying conditions, at least it, on average 2.6, on average 2.6 uh, uh, comorbidities or underlying conditions. And it's understandable with certain of those comorbidities or underlying conditions that it didn't do you a damn bit of good to catch COVID. That COVID sort of exacerbated the problem. I think that I think that most people 
I really do think most people realize that. What people are upset about is that the 189,000 number is not exactly the number for COVID deaths. Now, you may, now, it's all about, it's all about the terminology. You might have said COVID related deaths. That might have been more correct. In a time where what people didn't need was more fear, the mainstream media and the mainstream uh, a, a mainstream academia and mainstream medicine was perfectly good with making sure that people were as afraid as they could make them. A number like 180,000, 189,000 deaths, especially when it gets to 200,000 because the media loves a body count. They love the damn body count. Um, now what they hate is that we can look at that body count and multiply it by 0.06 and get the COVID only deaths. So if you've got COPD or hypertension or you're fat or or any or, or diabetes or any any of these other serious underlying conditions, yeah, be really careful because getting COVID is not good. Just it's bad. It's bad. And and the outcomes aren't normally very good. You may be able to shake it off. But it's gonna be a lot more difficult. And especially if you have the worst com comorbidity being 85 or older, really take care of yourself, really protect yourself. So the death count um, of COVID only um, today, un unfortunately, is 11,356, sadly. All right. Um, let's talk about California for a minute. Can we talk about California for a minute? Because you've heard about this. You've heard about um, SB 145 in California, Senate Bill um, 145. Now, the claim is, and what you're seeing is that California has legalized pedophilia. That's the claim. Let's dig in a little bit and see that maybe... California hasn't legalized pedophilia, but they have definitely opened the door to lower the penalty for pedophilia in California. The Associated Press, and I'll just go with this because this is enough. It's, it's so funny. I don't have to rail against everything that they put out. You can just go with what they put out because they think what they put out is and their viewpoint is perfectly okay when it's insane just on on his face. The AP's assessment is that it's, it's not true. SP 145 would not legalize pedophilia. It would only, listen to this, it would only give judges expanded discretion to determine whether an adult must register as a sex offender. Under current law, judges can make that decision in cases of voluntary but illegal vaginal sex with a minor 14 to 17 with an adult within 10 years of the minor's age. Let's talk examples. The 16-year-old is in a relationship with a 20-year-old. The 16-year-old girl is in a relationship with a 20-year-old boy. That's four years. My wife and I are... At, at, at four years apart. It would be like if I was in college and I showed up at her door and started dating her and then took her out in my car and had sex with her when she was 20. Actually, that would have never happened because I would have ended up in the woods somewhere and the ho hogs eat the bones and everything. There would have been no trace of me. That's what would have happened. But that's what we're talking about. They're less than 10 years apart and the sex may very well have been consensual. So the judge gets discretion on whether that adult who's 20, who's 20 years old, who's an adult, who's had sex with a minor, although it was consensual, if that person has to register as a sex offender. They already get that. Okay. 
SB 145 expands that law to in, uh, from vaginal sex to include voluntary oral and anal sex within the ages of 14 to, six, 14 to 17. That's what it does. Okay. Um, it would not apply to any minor under the age of 14, nor would it apply to any gap larger than 10 years. It would also not apply if either party claims that the sex was involuntary. Okay. Advocates of the bill, because this is what it's about. It's about NAMBLA. That's what it's about. This is about NAMBLA. Advocates say it makes the, um, the existing California law more inclusive for the LGBTQ community. It's about man-boy love. National Association for Man uh, Man Boy Love. This is what this is about. Again, so even on its face, it's awful. Although I can give you an example of, I just gave you an example of, of why it may be okay. So people are, are saying that pedophilia is illegal in, is legal in California. Um, let's just look at this. Does this open the door for such? Does it give judges a, a way to keep people who prey on young kids or younger kids from getting on the, um, have to register as sex offenders? So, a 24-year-old can have, a 24-year-old gay man can have anal sex with a 14-year-old boy. And not, and, and if it's consensual, not be put on the sex offender list. What do you think? Is that not pedophilia? Is that not pedophilia? Is it not? So a 14-year-old boy can consent to sexual activity, anal sex or, or, or oral sex? A 14-year-old boy can consent to that? When being manipulated by a 24-year-old man? Is that not pedophilia? So you play pedophilia to me. You comment below. We'll be right back. Hey, there's good news. There is good news. Mainstream media doesn't want you to know about good news. Nobody wants you to know about good news because good news gives you hope. And with hope, then that means you can you feel that like you can direct your own life and that you can make decisions for yourself and that you're not tied to the Leviathan that is big government or big media. Jobless claims are down for the last week of, um, of August. Um, let's go ahead and get into that story right now. Um, fewer than 1 million U.S. workers filed new claims for unemployment benefits in the final week of August, the Labor Department said in its weekly report um, yesterday. The government said 881,000 new claims for the week ending August 29th, a new low for unemployment claims since the, market, the labor market was rocked by the coronavirus pandemic. Economists had forecasted um, 958,000 new claims, down from the 1.006 million initially reported the prior week. 
The prior week was re revised up by five thousand dollars. Excuse me, by five thousand to one million eleven thousand. Claims hit a record six point eight seven million for the week of March twenty seventh. Until a month ago, each subsequent week had seen claims decline. But late in July, the labor market appeared to stall, and claims have hovered around a million. A level so high it was never um, re reco recorded before the pandemic struck. Jobless claims are a proxy for layoffs and have been closely watched as a signal for how the pandemic is influencing the economy, the article says. The Bureau of Labor Statistics said last week it was changing the method uh, employed for adjusting initial job claims to account for seasonal swings in employment. This means that this week's claims figures are not directly comparable to those in prior weeks. It is likely that the now retired method for making seasonal adjustments had inflated the level of claims over the past month or so. Now, we are in a time, of course, when people work seasonal jobs where, yeah, you're at the thing on in, in the summertime, and in August you go back to school and that job ends until the, until the following year. Where I, you know, because you guys know I work in a theme park, um, we have seasonal employees that do seasonal things like the the Halloween um, thing or the Christmas thing. They come in and do makeup and hair and costuming, and they and, and, and they may work haunted houses or they may work um, Santa's, you know, a Santa's house or or whatever. And those are just seasonal gigs, and um, so people may. They work seasonally that way. They may file for unemployment when their job is over. This new methodology accounts for that because that's not a function of the economy, really. That's a function of job choice. So the unadjusted initial jobless claims rose slightly to 833,000 from 825,000 the fifth straight week in with unadjusted claims have been below a million. Claims typically rise at the end of summer as seasonal work ends, is just what I said. Um, jobless claims can create a distorted picture of the labor market because they measure only job loss and not gained. Despite the hundreds of thousands of new claims continuing, um, uh, continuing claims during the week ending August 29th felled 13,000, excuse me, fell to 13,254,000, a decrease of 1.2 million from the previous week's re revised level. These new figures reported uh, with a weak lag, of course. The, ins the insured unemployment rate was 9.1% for the week ending August 22nd, a decline of eight-tenths of a, of, of a percentage point from the previous week unrevised rate. It's a lot, isn't it? It gets to be a lot. So you might want to re roll the video back a little bit and check it out. Uh, go through the numbers. This is uh, calculated on a different basis than the unemployment rate that will be reported in tomorrow's uh, or today's economic uh, um, excuse me, un unemployment employment report. The rate includes all those looking for work rather than those that are collecting unemployment insurance. State's hardest hit, Hawaii, has an un, has an insured employment rate, um, week uh, ending week uh, excuse me ending August fifteenth, we're in Hawaii at eighteen point six, Nevada, sixteen point four, California sixteen point three, Puerto Rico sixteen point one, New York fifteen point two, Connecticut fourteen. Point zero, Louisiana 13.3, Georgia 12.6, the Virgin Islands 11.8, the District of Columbia 11.7, and Massachusetts 11.7. Big job losses. Some of the most draconian lockdowns as well. Yeah, yeah, that too. The largest decreases were places like Florida. The big who had, who had the biggest decrease, um, and then Texas, New Jersey, Virginia, and North Carolina. But Florida, 
the Florida's decreases in in in, in an un, un, insured on un, uh, unemployed was as much as Texas, New Jersey, uh, and Virginia combined. Why? Because we're opening the state up. People are getting getting back to work in Florida, and that is super necessary. But again, job claims fell. The first time people filing for unemployment fell to 881,000 people. Now, that's a lot of folks. But we're headed the right direction. So no matter what the Biden campaign says, we are headed the right direction. We'll be back right after these messages. Do you care about black lives? The people that run Baltimore don't. I can prove it. Walk with me. They don't want you to see this. I'm Kim Klasik. This is Baltimore, the real Baltimore. This is the reality for black people every single day. Crumbling infrastructure, abandoned homes, poverty, and crime. Baltimore has been run by the Democrat Party for 53 years. What is the result of their decades of leadership? Baltimore is one of the top five most dangerous cities in America. The murder rate in Baltimore is 10 times the U.S. average. The Baltimore poverty rate is over 20%. Homicide, drug, and alcohol deaths are skyrocketing in our city. Do you believe Black Lives Matter? I do. The vast majority of crime in Baltimore is perpetrated against black people who make up 60% of the population. So why don't we care about our communities? The Democrat Party have betrayed the black people of Baltimore. If the politicians walk the streets like I do, they would see exactly how their policies and corruption affects us. But they don't want to see it. They don't want you to see this. Go to any Baltimore neighborhood and ask this question. Do you want to defund the police? No. No. Absolutely not. I had three sons killed in Baltimore City. And I think if we defund the police office, it's going to be worse than that. So no, I'm opposed to that. What are you going to defund the police for? Why? How do you defend your city, your community? Families are losing people. It's not just Baltimore. The worst place for a black person to live in America is a Democrat-controlled city. It's 2020. Name a blue city where black people's lives have gotten better. Try. I'll wait. Look at this. How are children supposed to live here and play here? Democrats think black people are stupid. They think they can control us forever. That we won't demand better and that we'll keep voting for them forever. Despite what they've done to our families and our communities. Are they right? I'm Kim Klasik and I'm running for Congress because I actually care about black lives. All black lives matter. Our communities matter. Baltimore matters. And black people don't have to vote Democrat. Well, hey, um, thanks again for hanging with us. Uh, <clears throat> it's just one, one, one last story here. Um, the vice, pre um, the former vice president of the United States, Joe Biden, was in Kenosha today. He spoke at a church um, to a community group, <clears throat> and basically spent a lot of time telling everybody how bad a guy and by how bad a president Donald Trump is. Uh, not offering help, not offering anything but more division and more hate. But that's for another time. <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to call the, pre the, the former vice president out on a narrative. I want to call the media out. I want to call some of my friends out um, on this narrative. Um, when 
because it's been going on for a while and it's it's just ridiculous that I don't I don't believe for a second that people don't know. You know, it's we sometimes on the right, we sometimes think that people just don't know. We give them the benefit of the doubt. We say that they're ignorant. We say that they're uninformed. We say that they're educated. That they're un, that they're not, they're not educated. I, you know, I just don't think that's it. I don't think that's it. What I do think is that people have a narrative that they're going to push and an agenda they're going to push. Come hell or high water, doesn't matter what the facts are. It doesn't matter. And those are the people that are really dangerous when the the truth of something and being found out that that what you're saying is wrong is is patently false that's a lie that doesn't slow you down and you keep repeating the same thing that makes you a dangerous individual and one of the things that keeps popping up like a bad penny is that President Trump um, did not denounce the neo-nazi the neo-nazis um and the kkk that were at charlottesville that, that keeps coming up so i like to go to sources that they use and one of the sources they use is this factcheck.org and the claim is former vice president joe biden, joe, joe biden wrongly claimed president donald trump has yet once to uh, condemn white supremacy, the, the neo-Nazis. Well, it's not exactly true. Here's what Biden says on February 9th, talking to George Steph, uh, Steph, Stephalophagus. George, I honestly, I honestly, God believe they're going to change the nature of who we are for a long time. Our children are listening. The idea, the man who can belittle people, go on dividing ba us based on race, Religion, ethnicity, based on all the things that, in fact, make up America is just incredibly divisive. You see these white supremacists coming out from under the rocks. He's yet once to condemn white supremacy, the neo-Nazis. He hasn't condemned a darn thing. He has, he has given them oxygen. And that's what they're going to, and that's what's going to happen. That's who this guy is. He has no basic American values. He doesn't understand the American code. Well, that's interesting. That was on February 9th. February 9th. Here's Trump on August 14th, 2017, which was obviously before this February 9th. As I said on Saturday, we condemn in the strongest possible terms this egregious display of hatred, bigotry, and violence. It has no place in America. As I've said many times before, no matter the color of our skin, we all live under the same laws, and we salute the same great flag, and we're all made by the same almighty God. We must love each other, show affection for one another, and unite together in condemnation of hatred, bigotry, and violence. We must rediscover the bonds of love and loyalty that bring us together as Americans. Racism is evil. And those who cause violence in, in, in its name are criminals and thugs, including the KKK, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and other hate groups that are repugnant to everything we hold dear as Americans. We are a nation founded on the truth that all of us are created equal. We are equal in the eyes of our creator. We are equal under the law. We are equal under our constitution. Those who spread violence in the name of bigotry strike at the very core of America. That was August 2017. Are you kidding me? Now, this is the next day. A reporter asked, you said there was hatred. There was violence on both sides. Well, I do think that there's blame. Yes, I think that this is Trump's response. I think there's blame on both sides. You look at, uh, you look at both sides. I think there's blame on both sides, and I think there's no doubt about it. And you don't have any doubt about it either. And, and, and if you report it accurately, you would say, the reporter says, the neo-Nazis started this thing. 
They showed up in Charlottesville. Excuse me? Trump says this. They didn't put themselves down as, as, as Neo, and you had some very bad people in that group, and but you also had some people who were very fine people on both sides. You had you had people in that group, excuse me, excuse me, because the reporter is... Um, I saw the same pictures that you did. You had people in the group that were to protest the taking down of them to a very, very important statue, renaming the park from Robert E. Lee to another name. And this is true in Charlottesville. There were people who just didn't want them to take the, to take the statue down or rename the park. They didn't come to cause trouble. They weren't neo-Nazis. They weren't KKK. They were just people who didn't want the change. It's fine. If you're, ta if you're changing history, you're changing culture. And you had people... And I'm not talk and I'm not talking about the neo Nazis and the white supremacists because they should be condemned totally. This is the very next day. You heard what he said on the fourteenth, and the very next day a reporter says, You didn't condemn them. So he condemns them again. It's amazing. So now, so now, we are still battling an, a, 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 an incorrect, I think, um, evil narrative. Thank you, Andrew Breitbart, for teaching me this. Whoever controls a narrative controls the whole thing. We've got to take back the narrative. How do we do that? Support conservative media. Not just Fox News, because Fox News ain't in. And if it were, it's not enough. One American News. Newsmax. Fightbackmedia.com. 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 Right Side Broadcasting Network. Because whoever controls the narrative, listen to me carefully, whoever controls the narrative controls everything. Whoever controls the speech. If I can tell you what words are good to say and what words you can never say, and the word, if I can tell you that the words that you do say don't have the meaning that you believe they have, I control the whole thing. Support conservative media. My name is Willie Lawson. This is the Morning Report for September 4th. 2020 in the year of our Lord. We'll see you on Monday. Have a great weekend. I'm going to. Sunday is my birthday. We'll see you soon. Peace.